uh, would you turn your Bible with me? Will you stand as, as I ask you to read in, in 1 Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians, uh, the first chapter. And I, I want to, to take time to read verse 1 to verse 10. Uh, first, uh, first Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men were among you for your sake. And ye became follow followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that we were ensembles to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God word, to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves shew of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's have a seat. I want to take this time to, to talk to you based on the scriptures that we just read about a model church. The, char the characteristics of a, of a model church. You know, model Christians make model churches. When I talk about church, I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about you. Save people. You are the church. We, the church is in a building, but actually you are the church. Without you, there is no church here. The church is the church here because you are in it. You are the church. Let's talk about a model church. What's, what's the model? When we want to study about a model church, where do we go? Is there a school that teaches about what a model church should look like? You see, probably no church on record sets before us a better, a better example of the execution of missionary out outreach than the church at Thessalonica. The Apostle Paul refers to it as an exemplary or sort of model church. In the whole chapter 1 of the first epistle to the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul is reflecting upon his visit to the city, stating that his entrance was not in vain. The history of this visit, you will find it in the book of Acts. Chapter 17, at the time, Thessalonica was a, was a city of very great importance, being, being the capital, one of the four districts of Macedonia, with an estimated population of 150,000. It was through Paul that Christianity reached the, this great metropolis, which was before he entered in a terrible state of gross idolatry and hidden darkness. Paul met with fierce antagonism when he started with his preaching of Jesus as the Messiah. The Jews who stubbornly refused to accept the gospel, when they saw certain Jews being converted to Christ, they began at once to initiate persecution. However, in spite of this obstruction, which was designed to nullify 
the, the, the effect of the preaching of God's word, Paul's mission among them was a grand success. A grand success. His ministry in the city of Thessalonica resulted in the establishment of what I will readily de designate as before mentioned a model New Testament church. We are all, of course, interested in models. Model cars, model homes, maybe a few model husbands and wives. So we are interested in models. The thing in which we are supremely interested, and I'm sure that which attracts us the most, of most of all as believers, is a model church. I want to be a part of a model church. I want to live in such a way that I am a model in my church. According to the description given in the chapter of, of which I, re, I refer, the membership of that church in Thessalonica was made up of Christians of higher caliber. Let me tell you, blessed is the church that has Christians of higher caliber. In most of our churches, so many of those that claim to be Christians, they have a shallow Christianity. A Christianity on the surface. But it's not deep. Everything disturbs them. Every detail torments them. It's shallow. Everything they hear, they believe. They don't balance things out with the word. It's shallow. But may I tell you, in the, uh, in the church of Thessalonica, the Christians were Christians of the highest caliber. Paul speaks of them as in samples. Verse 7, you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. In other words, the church at Thessalonica was a pattern church. Man, that's a big thing. It was a pattern church after which all other churches at that time scattered throughout Macedonia and Achaia patterned themselves. No doubt it happened something like this. If the establishment of any church in any center was contemplated invariably, the first step taken was a visit by a delegation to the church in Thessalonica. This delegation will become so entrenched, they will become so entrenched with the high spiritual state of that church that it became, it became to them, the church became to them a sort of criterion by which they will usually pattern their own. Are you with me? Fellow believers, it is not enough for us to be Christians. We ought every one of us to aim by the grace of God to be the ensemble kind. I'm, telling, I'm talking about the ensemble kind. Not someone that comes to sit in church, not someone that comes to listen to messages and go back home and live the same old way. I'm talking about to be the ensemble kind. Are you aware that we always pick the best for samples? These Christians at Thessalonica were simple Christians. They were simple Christians. After whom other Christians in various places throughout the country were desirous of shaping their own lives. Now here's the question. I ask you all over this building. If the Lord himself well, to select someone to show the world what a real Christian is like, I wonder, will he select you? Will he select me? The church at Thessalonica was a model church. We shall now consider what are the, char what are the characteristics of a model church as found in the church of Thessalonica. The first one I will mention is that of a converted membership. The church at Thessalonica had a converted membership. You see, it is evident the church at Thessalonica was made up of regenerated people. Paul states, that most Paul states it most clearly when he remarks, verse 9, You turn to God from idols. 
And my French Bible, the French version, you see, we have a French version, because in Haiti we speak French. It says, you get converted. That's what the French, my French Bible tells me. You turn to God from idols. You see, conversion is a turning to and turning from. You turning from to turn to. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. You cannot have a church like the one at Thessalonica with an unconverted membership. Which I may add is the curse of the hour. The prerequisite to drain a fraternal order or a lodge cannot be the same as those, re re as those required to drain a church. Our blessed Savior absolutely insisted upon the necessity of the new birth. When in conversation with Nicodemus, as we call it in John chapter 3, he told him, you must be born again. The writer of the Acts of the Apostles clearly states that in Jerusalem, the Lord added to the church such as were being saved. Mark it, please. Those who were being saved. No unsaved man or woman has any right to membership in a church that calls itself Christian. I will say that again. No unsaved man or woman has any right to membership in a church that calls itself Christian. Because it is not a fraternal order. It is not a lodge. It's a church. A church is made for saved people. If you are not saved, you get saved and you get in the church. That's how, that's how you get in the church. If you want to get inside the building, you just get on the highway, park your car, and you sit here. That's how you get in the building. But if you want to get in the church, you have to get saved. If you want to come to EBC, you get, one of those, you get on one of those highways, you find a spot in the parking lot, you enter the main gate here or the other gate behind me, and you sit, you listen to a sermon. Maybe when you listen to the sermon, if you are not saved, the preacher will sound like someone reciting a poem. You'll be clapping, you'll be jumping, but you're just in a place. You are not in the place. The church is made for saved people. And let me say this very quickly. An unregenerated person in the church, someone who is not regenerated, who is not born again, who is in a church building, is not only useless, useless, but is a positive hindrance. He could well be likened to a dead body lying around. If you can imagine such a thing, always in the way. You know, one of the distinctive qualities that made the Thessalonian, the Thessalonian church a truly exemplary church was the fact that the membership was made of regenerated and spiritual people they had undergone a spiritual change you see conversion is the result of salvation you get saved and you change how do you know you are saved by watching how much you've changed you don't say you are you walk as you are you don't carry a badge that says, I'm saved and I'm dangerous. <laughs> you conduct yourself in such a way that people that see you, they can testify that you are saved. As a matter of fact, the first Christians did not call themselves Christians. They were called Christians. By the way, that word Christians in the Greek means little Christ. Little Christ. Which means, if someone te comes to your house and asks to see Christ, don't tell them that he's in heaven. Don't tell them that he's out there. You can tell them 
If you want to see him, you can talk to me. Because he isn't me. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. You see, conversion is the result of salvation. If you want to know if you are saved, don't send anyone to EBC's office to ask the secretary so that she looks on the registry to find out if your name is there. If you want to know that you are saved, you have to know for yourself. The, the only one in this building that's saved is me. You're saying, why, preacher? Is it because you have the mic? No. The Bible says that I have to know for myself. You have to know for yourself. The Spirit himself ministers to my spirit that I am a child of God. So the same Spirit should minister to your spirit whether you are a child of God or not. So conversion is a result of salvation. The church of Thessalonica, they were a model church because the membership was made of converted people. There is a big difference between church attendant and converted people. I'll say it again. It might make some people here mad. But this is the word. You can hit me. I'm standing behind the word. There is a difference between church attendance and converted people. You see, my friend, my brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the distinctive qualities that made the Thessalonian church a truly exemplary church was the fact that the, mem the membership was made up regenerated and spiritual people. They had undergone a spiritual change. When a person is thus changed by means of a new birth, he will certainly give outward proof of the genuineness, of the genuineness of his conversion. The apostle Paul noted three signs of conversion among the Thessalonians. Let me very quickly tell you those three signs. In verse 3, it talks about faith, love, hope. You know how you can tell these people were converted people? First of all, they had an active faith. James speaks about a faith that is dead, but these people had a faith that was alive. You see, we can have a church that is alive. We, 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 we cannot have a church that is alive if people are not converted. But we can have a church that is alive when every member is on the job, living consecrated Christian lives, attending every service, giving as God prospers, and working hard every day for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. That's called active faith. The Thessalonians had that. The church of Thessalonians, of Thessalonica. Secondly, they displayed a, labo a, a laborious love. You see, verse 3. True love is a laborious love. It is not content to stay idle, selfish. It goes out looking for something to do, which will bring glory to God and blessing to men. If you say you love the Lord, do something. If you say you love the Lord, serve him. If you say you love the Lord, put your love in action. It was such. And the, Thessalonian, and the church of Thessalonica, it was, they had a love that was not content, that, that was not satisfied with itself doing nothing. You see, not only did they have an active faith, a laborious love, they had a patient hope. Patient hope. You have an illustration of that in the last verse. The apostle Paul says in verse 10, they waited for God's son from heaven. You see, Jesus Christ promised that he will come again. 
They believe that this event will take place exactly as promised. So they live daily in expectation of his glorious return. They were heavenly minded people. They continually had heaven on their mind. When you are saved, you, are, you have been converted, you always have heaven on your mind. You may go through hardships, difficulties, all kind of trials, but when heaven is on your mind, you don't care. You are on your way to glory. So these people were converted people. That's the, that's the first thing that makes them a model church. They had a converted membership. You see, the great danger faced by the Christian church is to have unconverted persons not baptized with the Holy Spirit to become members of the local church. The consequences are church organizations and activities without the control, guidance, and power of the Holy Spirit. Great efforts are made to obtain spiritual results without spiritual means and method and spiritual power. We are not in church to find a few good spiritual recipes to live a good and prosperous life on earth. We come to church to change our ways. That's the difference between a mechanic church and a dynamic church. That's a big difference. A converted membership, that's what they had. Secondly, the church of Thessalonica was a model church. They had an anointed leadership. They had an anointed leadership. Paul had a delightful time there in preaching to those Thessalonians. He fell as he ministered the supernatural power resting upon him. Our gospel, he says in verse 5, came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. You see, the leadership was anointed. The greatest danger ever in a local church is to put people that are not anointed in authority. That's a danger. It's like putting a teenager that, do not have a, that doesn't have a license behind a Cadillac, behind the steering wheels of a Cadillac, behind the steering wheels of a Volvo. You see, experience tells us that when the gospel is preached in word only, little, if any impression is made upon the hearers, we can get along without eloquence, but without the power of the Holy Spirit, our ministry, we must, con we must confess, is utterly futile. The church of Thessalonica started and grew with an anointed leadership. Those people were anointed. It is a, it is a privilege and a necessity for every Christian to seek fresh anointing for any and every specific service without the fresh anointing we become powerless formalistic and dictatorial in our service it is that fresh anointing under the leadership of the holy spirit that makes us effective and not merely active you may be active without being effective if you don't have with you the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When the power of God is present in a meeting, something is sure to happen. We can look for wonders to be done in the name of Jesus Christ. The blind receive the sight, the deaf are made to hear, the lame are made to walk, and the dead are raised to life back again. Anointing leads to serving. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Do you know why we do not have too many people serving in our churches? It's because not all of them have been anointed. Once you are anointed, you serve. Serving is the result of anointing. Are you with me? When, once you are anointed, it's naturally for you to serve. Anointment leads to service. 
Listen, I may be here and spend the whole day preaching and preaching and tell you, serve God, serve God, serve God. It will not amount to anything if you are not anointed. If the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to you, if the Holy Spirit doesn't cover you with his power so that you see that you need to serve, nothing will happen. I'm not talking about power to be saved. I'm talking about power to serve. Anointing is power to serve. If we go for the Lord without the anointing, we will eventually make a fool of ourselves. Moses, Isaiah, David, the disciples could not do it without the anointing. Those that sing should be anointed. Those that pray should be anointed. If, listen, I don't care what you do in a church. Even if you, if, if you sweep the floor, you should be anointed to sweep the floor. I'm talking about church. Even if, even if you just put a little water on the plants, you should be anointed to do that. Church work is about anointing. It's not a party. It's not a place that you come to just dance and boogie. Church is about anointing. To serve, you, be, you need to be under the power of the Holy Spirit. This is church. This is not a party place. This is a place where we think about Him. Him. And Him only. There are a lot of things that we can do without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can work. You can do your work at home. You can go on your computer without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can put, you, as a mason, you can put one block on another block without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can cook without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can, you, 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 you can sue uh, how, should I, how, should, how should I put it? You can put a shirt together without the power of the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of things that you can do without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can play soccer, play football, play basketball, play tennis without the power of the Holy Spirit. Now hear me out. You cannot do church without the power of the Holy Spirit. You just can't. You just can't. It becomes a dredge. Doing all this without the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Mardi Gras. You understand that? Mardi Gras. Just carrying a mask. You can't do it without the power of the anointment. It's like mimicking. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, it's just pure Mardi Gras. Mimicking. Serving God needs the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But let me end by saying that the church of, the, of Thessalonica was a model church. Not only they had in the midst a converted membership, they had an anointed leadership. But finally, they had a missionary zeal. A missionary zeal. God's fullest blessing upon our churches and our lives can never be obtained apart from our individual responsibility to our Savior's missionary program. I do not believe that we can consciously pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit and God's overflowing joy and peace if we hold a mental reservation to remain indifferent to soul winning. The mission fields belong to the Christ obedient and Holy Spirit filled Christian. Upon this special quality, the apostle lays great stress. Please follow me in verse 8 as I end. Where we read Paul striking description of the amazing accomplishment. Paul said, from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Listen now. We, we must be in all day missionary churches 
if we are to be accounted worthy to bear, to bear the name of the one who came from heaven to give his life a ransom for many. You see, we don't have to go far to look what a model church should look like. A converted membership, an anointed leadership, a missionary zeal. I told the story this morning about a friend of mine I have, I have not seen in a while. And I, I asked him, oh, how are you? I haven't been, I haven't been seeing you, I haven't seen you in a while. What, are, what have you been doing? He told me, work. I, I asked him, why do you work so hard? He told me to make money. I told him, why do you need so much money? He told me to live. I asked him, why do you live? He told me, to work. <laughs> you see, most people live that way. They work to live, to make money, to work, to live, to make money, to work, to live. It never dawns on them that someday they will wake up and not show up for work. They'll wake up dead. You see, death is a reservation. Someday we will wake up dead. Do, 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 do you hear me? But where will you wake up? That's the matter. Well, you will wake up matters. What matters is where you will wake up. It matters. Listen, we should be model Christians so that our church can be a model church. Converted membership, anointed leadership, missionary zeal. Tell people about Christ. But to do that, you need to commit yourself, your life to God. I told the story this morning about a pig and a chicken. They were passing by a breakfast restaurant. And there was a sign on the restaurant that said, we need ham and eggs for charity, for a charity breakfast for kids in the community. The pig and the chicken look at each other. And the, the, the chicken said to the pig, Let's go and donate something. The pig said, no. The chicken said, why? The pig said to the chicken, for you to go in there to donate something, it will be a contribution. But for me, it will be a commitment. You see, the chicken will only have to give an egg. The, the pig will have to die. You see, we have two sets of people in this building. Two sets. Two sets. We don't have two, we don't, we don't have three, we don't have four. We have two sets of people in this building. I've come all this way to tell you prophetically that we have two sets of people in this building. Something's got to change. I'm saying it again. Something's got to change. Now, do you have enough courage to admit that something's got to change in me? Two sets. There is one set that just comes to church to give a contribution. But praise God, there is another set. Hallelujah. There is another set that has come to church to bring commitment, to live consecrated lives, to sing, I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Headaches, broken pieces, ruined life. That's why you died on Calvary. Your love and touch. That's why I long for you have given life to me. Now, are you here for a contribution? Or are you here for a commitment? May I tell you, if you are saved, you should be committed. If you are bound to heaven, you should be committed. If you remember where the Lord took you, you should be committed. If today you can sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. 
because of what he had done for you, you should be committed. Do I hear hallelujah? Do I hear praise the Lord? Do I hear glory to God? Listen, listen. If, if you still have food on your table, if you still have a place to live in this broken economy, you should be committed to him. He's taking good care of you. If you haven't lost your mind, despite all the trials and hardships you've been through, he had done everything for you. You should be committed to him. If you are healthy with no health insurance because of him taking good care of you, you should be committed to him. If you are wealthy with no money in the bank, he's been taking good care of you. You should be committed to him. If you have a reservation for heaven someday, you're going to see him face to face. You should be committed. Not just a contribution, but commitment. Let us be a model church with a converted membership, with an adwended leadership, with a missionary zeal. Now you stand right here. I'm going to tell you a short story and I'll end. President Roosevelt went hunting in Africa. A missionary couple who had served for many years in Africa were returning to the United States, leaving Africa with broken health, no pension. These missionaries felt defeated, discouraged, and afraid after serving in Africa for years as missionary. It turned out that President Teddy Roosevelt was traveling on the same ship. Of course, it caused a great commotion as everyone tried to catch a glimpse of the president who was returning from a hunting expedition. The missionary commented to his wife, something is wrong, honey. Why should we, who have given our lives in service to the Lord all these years in Africa, come back and not receive any fanfare or attention? No band playing for us. They are playing for the president. No attention. And this man who has done nothing more than just go on a hunting trip, is the center of attention. He said, honey, it just doesn't seem right. You know, when the ship arrived, a brass band played, and the mayor, the mayor welcomed the president. The missionary was so discouraged. It isn't fair, he told his wife. Why have we not received any attention or adulation for what we have done? God is not treating us fairly. She said, honey, why don't you just go tell that to the Lord? <laughs> a little bit later, he was smiling. His wife said, you look different. What happened? He said, well, I told the Lord how bitter I was that the president received this tremendous homecoming while no one greeted us when we returned home. He said to his wife, but the Lord told me we are not home yet. <laughs> the Lord told me we are not home yet let me tell you if you are going to hardships if you are going to difficulties if it is painful hanging there we are not home yet let us be a model church with a converted membership with an anointed leadership with a missionary zeal hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen, and amen.